Hello and welcome to the Audio Epics podcast and the final episode of The Beast of the Western Wilds, A Witch Hunter Tale. As promised, um, as we release this final episode, The Beast of the Western Wilds is also out on Bandcamp today. And what that means is that you can purchase a high-quality download of the entire story without interruptions, without me whining in the introductions uh, every time, just purely the story. And in addition, of course, the book version is also still available on Amazon and on Kindle. And to celebrate the release, we've also got a temporary discount going on Bandcamp. You can now get all three stories that we've done as audio epics, that is Witch Hunter, The Beast of the Western Wilds, and The Will of the Woods, together for only $16.90. That's a 35% discount. So if you want to own The Beast of the Western Wilds, um, these are the options for now. There will also be a CD version later on, but as I said, um, we're still waiting for the final cover. Anyway, before we dive into the story itself and the conclusion of Ludlow's adventures in Schnatwald, um, I just want to say that keep listening to the end because there will be another announcement um, that I want to keep until the very end of this episode. Anyway, please enjoy the final part of The Beast of the Western Wilds. The Final Encounter Ludlove felt like he was shaken out of a bad dream with a splash of cold water. In an instant, Krasualdin and her terrible realm were gone. He felt wet and cold and in pain. Something was pulling at him, lifting him. Then he fell down on his back on a soggy ground. He heard a young man's voice. Is, he, is his heart still going? Let him be, let him be. Don't there were two voices, talking to each other in hushed tones. He opened his eyes and saw nothing but darkness. Then a hand grabbed his shoulder, and a welcome face appeared, lit by the flame of a torch. Master Ludloff, are you all right? Conrad? The guardsman? Yes, master, at your service. How, how did I... How did I end up here? The chain. The chain. Ludlove slowly got up. He was by the black pool again. But it was night. Conrad's torch was the only source of light. Then he noticed Fulcrin perched on the young man's shoulder. And strangely enough, there was Hans, standing behind Conrad. His pale, rake-thin appearance was a little disturbing, but his innocent face made up for that. You're alive. <laughs> you seem to have a hard time believing it. Well, we've been at this pool for a while now, and just now you appeared, floating face down in it. Ludlove looked at the guardsman in astonishment. Really? Huh. Well... Thanks for pulling me out. You may thank your feathery friend. And this lad here. Thank you all. Ludlove took off his glove and went with his hand through his hair. He pulled out a strand of dead algae and threw it away. Then his hand went to his chest. Ah, oh, thank the God. The amulet was still there. A feeling of great comfort washed over him for a moment. Then he thought of that sacred chain, and how it now lay buried in the depths of Krasualdin's realm, most likely lost forever. The very image filled him with sadness, but it was the only way. The chain had fulfilled its purpose. Hans came to offer him his hat and clothes. Ludlov gratefully accepted them and put them on. He felt a little bit more himself again, but the shame of his near seduction would stay with him for a long time. What happened, Master? Well... Ludlove was suddenly overcome with shame at the memories. 
Well, <clears throat> uh, let's just say I traveled to the underworld, and with the help of a saint, I bound a demon. Let's just leave it at that. <laughs> just another day at the job then, I suppose. <laughs> well, that was my side of the story. What's yours? Well, your falcon came fluttering into our village, squawking and scratching and generally making a fuss. We didn't quite know what to make of it, but then I figured out he was trying to tell us something. So I decided to follow him. Adolfon stayed behind with Nicky. Those two seemed to be getting along more than well enough without me, if you catch my meaning. Anyway, I made my way all through the black wood to this place, where I found this lad sitting on that log, holding your hat. I thought you were going to kill me, to be frank. Well, for all I knew, you just killed Master Ludlov. What were you doing here, Hans? I never thought Count Adelhard would let you leave the castle on your own. He wouldn't, sir. But I've known the castle my whole life. I know every way in and every way out. I come and go as I please. And I wanted to follow you. So that's what I did. I wanted to know if you could rid us of... of her. Ludlov smiled. Well, well. I guess there's some spirit to you after all. <laughs> Hans let out a humble little laugh at the compliment, but then his face turned very serious again. You must understand, sir. She wanted to make me... like father. And I am grateful for that man, but I do not want to follow in his footsteps. All my life I fought against her in my dreams. And I'm getting tired. I can't keep it up any longer. Ludlov laid a hand on Hans's shoulder. If you could withstand her all these years on your own, then you are the strongest man I've ever met, Hans. I am not, sir. I believe I was helped, but not by my father. But did you succeed? Is she... His eyes were full of hope. She is bound in chains from which she cannot escape and buried under an avalanche. She will remain locked in her own realm forever. She may still haunt your dreams, but if you persist in prayer and in discipline, in time her power will wane and disappear forever. Tears welled up in the young man's eyes. Thank you, sir. It was all he could utter, but it came from the depths of his heart. Nevertheless, the mark she has made upon this world cannot simply be erased. And her beast still prowls about, now no longer bound by any rules. It will go where it pleases. Hang on a minute, is this the beast that killed Rudolph we're talking about? Ludlov assumed that the beast's first stop would be the castle. All these years it had been conditioned to go after the lineage of Edelhart. It would still be out to kill Frederick. And so the three men made their way back to the castle. The door was wide open, and no light shone behind the windows. Comrade's torch was all they had as they entered. The creature may already be here. Be on your guard. Then Ludlov turned to Hans. You are unarmed. I can give you my pistol if you wish. Do you know how to shoot? The young man simply shook his head. I don't need any weapons, sir. Are you sure? Very sure, sir. Ludlov could tell it would be pointless to argue with him, so he decided to arm himself as best as he could instead. <laughs> Drawing both his pistol and his rapier, he softly treaded into the cold great hall of Castle Edelhart. The three proceeded carefully. Ludlov went ahead with Fulcrin on his shoulder, and Conrad made sure he was always right behind him with his torch. 
Hans simply followed calmly, as if he was making a stroll. There was something distinctly unnerving about the young man. They arrived at the door that gave way to the library and entered it. It was only slightly less dark here. The fire was almost out. The familiar furniture was still there, all arranged just as it had been. There was no sign of any violence or chaos, nor were there any footprints to be seen. Nothing was out of the ordinary, except when Ludlow looked in the direction of the smoldering hearth fire. An empty glass lay on the stained carpet, and there was someone in the chair. His body was hidden behind the backrest, but his hand hung out limply. Father? Ludlov and Conrad exchanged worried glances as Hans sprang off and knelt beside the chair, taking the hand. He bowed his head. The other men walked over. There was Count Edelhart, dead. He sat there with his eyes firmly shut and his mouth open, like a snoring old man taking an afternoon nap. He seemed very small. He went peacefully, at least. Hans ignored Ludlow, still caressing the dead man's hand. I am truly sorry, Hans, but we have to go. The young man looked up at him with pleading, tear-filled eyes. What will happen to his soul now, sir? Will he be taken by her? <sighs> Ludlow lowered his weapons. You deserve an honest reply. When I bound the demon, she renounced her magic over this castle. I think that is why he died. Her spells were all that kept him alive after all these years. But he made a pact with her, Hans. Demons can alter their deals with men, but not the other way around. Unless he repented and turned to the goddess at last, I don't think there is much hope. Thank you for being honest. Hans got up and turned to the dead count. Farewell, my lord. I know you were never my father, but you acted as one, and so I recognized you as one. Now it is time for me to go my own way. Well said. I will mourn him, but not now. Now we fight the beast. Ludlow raised his weapons again. Good. Let's proceed then. We should find Captain Elsenbach and Frederick. Conrad's eyes widened. They're both here? Alive? I hope so. They were when I left for the pool. Hans showed them the way upstairs to the baby's room. A creaky wooden staircase led up to the first floor, leading to a well-maintained hallway with a red carpet. The bedroom was behind a double door, which was now closed. Ludlow tried to open it, but it was locked from the inside. He knocked. Captain? He heard furniture being moved around. Then the door was unlocked and a frantic Captain Elsenbach pulled him inside, no longer wearing any bandages and looking quite energetic. He was already about to shut the door again, but Ludlow interrupted him. Wait, 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 Captain. There are two more men outside. The Captain opened the door again. Upon seeing Conrad, he gasped. When everyone had entered, he hastily locked the door again. Then he immediately grasped his younger colleague in a powerful hug, Conrad. ignoring the burning <laughs> torch. Hello, Captain. I should see you. Ludlow looked around. The room was extraordinarily beautiful. The walls were fully decorated with paintings of flowers, pink clouds and friendly cherubs. The baby's bed stood in the center of the room, beneath a beautiful white veil that hung suspended from a gold-colored rope. An angel painted on the ceiling seemed to be holding it aloft. The small, round fireplace brought warmth and light to the room. 
Captain Halsenbach simply took Conrad's torch and put it in the fire. Where's the Count? He's dead. Halsenbach leaned against the wall, crossing his arms. The beast? No. He just died. Conrad walked over to the bed to watch the baby. Poor thing's asleep. He must be hungry. He became hungry about an hour ago. Before that, he's done almost nothing but sleep. That makes sense. The demon's spell over this castle is lifted, and with it, death and all the ordinary needs of the human body have returned. So that is the strange pain I have been feeling inside. It's hunger? Don't tell me you don't know what hunger is, friend. I don't. Oh. The baby cried himself to sleep. I, I couldn't feed him. But that's the least of our worries for now. The beast, Witch Hunter, it's inside. Only now did Ludlow notice the large scar that ran across Captain Elzenbach's face. Are you sure? I saw no sign of the creature. Oh, I'm sure. I've seen it. it. Came sniffing at our door, but I kept it locked and barred with that bookcase over there. He pointed to a very large case that stood slantwise in the room. Then the thing wandered off, but I'm certain it's still on the castle grounds. It's waiting for you to come out of your hiding place. Knowing you can't stay here forever. A real predator. So what do you suggest? Do we seek it out? Or what? Ludlow looked at the door, then back to the group. We don't have a choice, do we? But the baby needs to be protected. So I suggest someone stays here, well fortified. Captain, I think you are dying to see some action, and... And you are the most capable fighter of us all. Would you join us? Captain Elzenbach walked over and gave the witch hunter a friendly slap on his shoulder. I thought you'd never ask. But I need to be sure my grandson is safe. Hans, you are unarmed and inexperienced in combat. And you are very good with the guests. Will you watch Frederick for us? Pardon me, sir. But I think you will be happy to have me with you. Well, I appreciate the sentiment, but, uh... I don't think you understand, sir. You need me with you. Why, Hans? <sighs> I know the castle. I know its inhabitants. I can help you in a way neither of these men can. Rudolf was still doubtful. But then Conrad spoke up. It's all right. I will stay here with the boy. He drew his rapier, took it by the blade and handed it to Hans, hilled first. Here, have this. It may come in handy. Hans accepted the weapon uncertainly, then raised it and slashed it about in the air. You're a natural. <laughs> All right. It's settled then. We go beast hunting. Hans, since you are joining us and you know the castle, where would you go? Hans lowered his blade. The dining room. It's central. And from there we can easily lead the beast to the cellars. That's what we need to do. Why the cellars? There will be a surprise waiting for it there. Hmm. But if we go to a central location, that also means the beast could approach us from any direction. And there won't be time to barricade the entrances. Look, I know this castle. We need to drive the beast to the cellars. We'll just have to be on our guard. Captain, can you... <laughs> With a thundering clash, three razor-sharp nails burst through the door. The beast roared on the other side. Without the barricade, the wooden door stood no chance. Immediately, Captain Elzenbach grabbed the baby from the bed and backed off from the door. Little Frederick woke up and began to cry. Meanwhile, the monster kept banging at the door, hacking away pieces of wood with its massive claws. Without delay, Hans went over to a corner in the room where a small painting hung. He slid the painting aside, revealing a small switch. He flicked the switch, and immediately a portion of the wall swung open. A secret door! Captain Elzenbach took the baby with him into the newly revealed passageway. Hans and Conrad followed. Fulcrin flew in behind them. Only Ludlow stayed behind just long enough to load his pistol. He saw the monster, fully bursting through the door, 
its green eyes glowing with infernal fury, its sharp fangs dripping with saliva. Ludlov wasted no time and immediately shot at the monster, then backed down into the secret doorway and closed the door. He could still hear the beast roaring furiously. They were in the dark now, but Hans knew the way. He led them down the stairwell, through another secret door, into the pantry. It was still dark there, but at least they could see the night sky through the window. Fulcrin fluttered onto the witch hunter's shoulder and remained there. Everyone was quiet. Even Frederick had reduced his crying to a soft moaning. They were still recovering from the narrow escape. Hans rummaged around a bit until he found an oil lamp. He lit it and lifted it up. He looked ghostly in its soft glow. The other men followed him into the kitchen. Hans strode straight ahead. The dining hall is just beyond this door. Wait, Hans, wait. Where could the monster have gone? It could be anywhere. If this fellow says we need to go to the cellars, I suggest we're as quick about it as possible. Very well. Conrad, take the baby. We need the captain's fighting arm. Now that we're all here, maybe I should take the child. I think Conrad will be a better fighter. Of course. Hans returned Conrad's rapier and gave him the oil lamp as well. Then Captain Elsenbach handed over Frederick. Holding and comforting the baby seemed to come naturally to the young man. Meanwhile, Ludlov reloaded his pistol with a silver bullet. All right, Conrad. You take the lead. The guardsman obeyed and opened the door to the dining hall. It was a very large space. Its arched ceiling and rows of pillars made it look almost like a church. There were three great chandeliers over a very long table. Tapestries bearing heraldic devices hung from the pillars. There was a stained glass window on one side, fairly high up. It depicted a rearing stag in a field of roses, but it was not very clearly visible at night. They entered slowly, weapons drawn, forming a protective circle around Hans and the baby. We're exposed here, witch hunter. We had better be quick. Ludlov had to agree. They passed the first two pillars, then halted. Near the last pillar, two glowing green eyes appeared, accompanied by a slow, deep, rumbling growl. The monster emerged out of the shadows, dripping blood from its shoulder where it had been wounded earlier. It looked even angrier than before, if that was possible. Suddenly, Hans darted off in the direction of a door to their right. The beast leaped out of the shadows to grasp him and the baby, but Captain Elsenbach jumped in between them. Die, he beast. slashed at the monster with his blade, only to be swept aside by its mighty claw. Conrad attacked the creature from behind, on, causing it to rear its head and snap at him. The guardsman jumped back, raising his blade again. The beast moved too quickly for a perfectly aimed shot, but Ludlov had to do something. He pointed his pistol in the direction of its head and pulled the trigger. With a deafening blast and a cloud of smoke, he hit the creature in the massive, overdeveloped muscles of its neck. Falkrin flew off in a panic. The monster's attention turned to the witch hunter now. Its bared teeth reflected the green glow that emanated from its eyes. Ludlov jumped out of the way to hide behind the pillar. Meanwhile, Captain Elsenbach and Conrad made a joint attempt to weary the hellish thing, cutting and running as it grew wild with anger and frustration. Ludlov took a quick look and saw that Hans had opened the cellar door and disappeared into it, carrying Frederick with him. The best he could do now was simply draw the monster's attention away from that door, gathering all his courage. Ludlov waited until the beast had its back turned away from him. 
Then he ran up to it and jumped on top of its back, clinging to the long shaggy fur as it stood up on its hind legs, trying to shake him up. <coughs> Elzenbach and Conrad used the opportunity to slash away at the monster's torso. Take that, you hellish swine! <coughs> Ludlov swung his blade at one of its long, pointy ears. He managed to slice the ear, spilling black blood. With hysterical ferocity, the monster pushed its back against one of the pillars, squashing Ludlov between itself and the hard stone. The witch hunter had all the air knocked out of his lungs, thought he heard something crack inside his body. He let go of the monster's fur and fell down onto the floor. The beast gave him no further attention and veered towards the captain. He fought valiantly, but his thin blade was simply no match for the enormous claws of the beast. The monster simply swatted the man away, causing him to fall to the floor as helplessly as Ludlow. Licking its teeth with a thick, slimy tongue, the beast now made ready to sink its fangs into the captain's flesh. Ludlow tried to get up, but he was too slow. Then, as the monster was about to maul the captain, Conrad took his blade in both hands and plunged it into the beast's side. The rapier sank so deep into the thick skin that Conrad couldn't pull it out anymore. Roaring in pain, the creature turned to the guardsman and with the impossibly rapid movement of a snake, it snatched him in his claw. Conrad screamed helplessly as the beast crushed him in its fist. His cries ended as he was lifted up and his head disappeared beyond the monster's massive jaw. Ludlow felt sick as he heard the cracking of bones and the ripping of flesh inside the beast's maw. Conrad was dead, the captain was incapacitated, and Ludlow could barely stand. As the monster swallowed down Conrad's skull and turned its head towards Ludlow, he could swear he saw a grin of provocative glee appearing in its beastly features. The expression reminded him of Krasowaldi. The beast hadn't forgotten about the two bullets and the slashed ear. Ludlow raised his rapier, but he knew there was nothing he could do. Then all of a sudden, the dining hall was filled with the angry cries of a dozen small but vicious creatures. Out of the doorway to the cellar they came, leaping up on top of the beast. They were the Count's minions, the same snatchers that had stolen Frederick and attacked Ludlow and the captain in the woods. But now, their fury was aimed entirely at the beast. Crawling through its fur, slashing at its throat, biting its ears and gnawing in its sides. The crazed brute managed to shake off some of them and crush others beneath its mighty claws. But more kept coming biting, screaming, and sinking their claws into its skin. Now Fulcrin descended from on high and joined the Snatchers in their fury. Eventually, the creatures overpowered the beast. Its roars turned to growls, then to moans, and eventually silence, as it lay ripped open and shredded asunder 
on the cold stone floor. The little monsters scuttled out of the way, and Hans appeared out of the cellar, still carrying the baby. The beast's chest moved slowly up and down in its final ragged breaths. I'll let one of you finish it. Ludlow turned to Captain Helsenbach, who had crawled upright very slowly. He stumbled over, favoring one leg, but holding his rapier firmly clasped in his hand. The honor is yours, Captain. Elsenbach nodded appreciatively. He made his way to the side of the beast and looked down. He didn't waste any words and simply slid his blade fluently through the monster's throat. Black blood gushed out, quickly forming a dark pool. Then the captain spat on the remaining corpse. <laughs> so ends the beast of the Western Wilds. Epilogue. The morning rain clattered on the forest canopy and streamed between the leaves onto a muddy ground. The quiet company of travelers had left the Black Woods and was now making their way through the untainted parts of the Western Wilds back to Schnertwald. Captain Elsenbach walked ahead of the group, carrying baby Frederick in his arms. Despite his fatigue and his sorrow over the men he had lost in these terrible days, his face reflected a deep gratitude for the safety of his beloved grandson. Behind him were Ludlow and then Hans, carrying a simple makeshift stretcher together. On it rested the remains of Conrad, carefully wrapped in linen, tied to the stretcher with rope. Fulcrin sat on top of the corpse, like a silent guardian. I sent him out to find a priest to bless Rudolf on his last journey. I hope he did, and the priest is still in the village for his funeral. No one responded. They were all tired. Hans was clearly sad for the demise of the Count, which Ludlow could understand despite the nobleman's unpleasant character. For years he had been Hans's only company. Now the young man was surrounded by friends, but his foster father must have left a gaping hole in his heart. After the demon's monstrous beast had been slain, Hans had wasted no time in giving Count Edelhart a simple but solemn burial ceremony in the family crypt beside his wife. The captain and Ludlow had both attended in silence. Afterwards, Ludlow had offered Hans a chance to journey back to Schnatwald along with himself, Captain Elsenbach, and the child. Hans had gratefully accepted it. There was nothing left for him in the castle now, and the thought of meeting his mother excited him, though it also filled him with anxiety and uncertainty. After another half hour of marching in silence, bright green ferns started to pop up between the trees, giving the woods a fresher, more welcoming appearance. Captain Elsenbach spoke up. I never thought I would say anything nice about those creatures, but you did well unleashing them from the cellar, Hans. His face would forever bear the scar those little monsters had given him, but in the hour of greatest need, their intervention had been most welcome. Hans would have shrugged if he hadn't been carrying the stretcher, the Snatchers are creatures created by magic that has long run in the Edelhart family. As the Count's adoptive son, I learned to control them. It was only fitting I did what I could to help out. Elsenbach turned around to face Ludlow. What do you say of that, witch hunter? He used magic. Shouldn't he be prosecuted? Ludlow didn't respond. In his heart, he knew it had not been archaic that Hans had been using to guide those creatures. 
the language of the goddess didn't conduce to such vile practices. The Edelhearts had most likely been dabbling in dark forms of flesh magic, an utter perversion that needed to be stamped out. However, he could find no culpability in Hans. Even without Ludlow's insistence, he had slit the throat of every one of those abominations and burned their corpses. Ludlow could ask for no clearer sign that the young man was willing to leave behind the wickedness in which he had been raised. Taking him to the civilized world was the best he could do for him now. After a long while, Ludlow did say something in reply. My heart tells me that the goddess still has plans for Hans. Plans unknown to any of us. Then he smiled. As they continued their march, the rain slowly ended and the verdant woods bathed in the golden light of the morning. The sun rose behind the trees, its rays piercing through the canopy from time to time. Ahead of the men now lay a quiet bank of low fog shrouding the muddy path. Birds sang cheerfully, as the scent of the freshly washed forest invigorated their senses. At noon, they stopped for a brief respite, but they had little in the way of food. Captain Elsenbach had nothing more to offer little Frederick than a few sips of water, which did nothing to abate the baby's hungry cries. And so they quickly continued on their journey again. It was a sunny afternoon when the scent of burning wood from the Schnatwald chimneys reached their nostrils. Frederick was still crying, and his mother had heard it. She came running along the path to meet them, tears streaming from her joyous face. Oh, father! Nikki! Frederick! <laughs> Nikki clasped her arms around his, wrapping her baby boy in the collective love of her father and herself. Ludlow and Hans both laughed when they saw the unbridled joy of the reunited family. <laughs> Captain Elsenbach handed over the baby to his daughter. Little Frederick immediately began looking for milk. <laughs> a little while later, they arrived in Schnatwald, a bright spring sun shining down on their faces. Seeing the cozy houses and the pleasant trees, Ludlow could hardly believe what nightmares they had faced in the wilds. Even the news of Conrad's death, while shocking, was eased by the joy of their reunion. Then Nikki announced her engagement to Adolphans, and it was the captain's turn to shed tears. Ludlow and Hans looked on approvingly. Their family will be whole once more, Hans. Now, I believe, it's your turn. Leaving the Elsenbachs, Ludlow led Hans to Heidi Winkler's house and knocked on the door. When she opened, she was at first friendly but somber. Then she took a good look at the man at Ludlow's side and knew who he was. Hans? Yes, it's me, Mother. Mother and son found each other in a tight embrace and Ludlow knew his part in this story had been played. He quietly left the garden and returned to the village. There he saw an old bearded priest walking the gravelly main street. He tipped his hat to the clergyman, who responded with a solemn bow. Then Ludlow made his way to the town hall, where Dr. Schmetterling was just closing the door behind him to leave. When the doctor saw Ludlow, he immediately came towards him with an outstretched hand. The two men clasped hands and smiled at each other. Excellent work, Fitch Hunter. Seven Peaks has lived up to its reputation. Ah, thank you, doctor. Albrecht, bitte schön. I know Witch Hunters aren't allowed to accept payment for their services, but surely a friendly drink among men will not pose a problem. I have an excellent vintage that's been waiting for an occasion such as this. Ludlow raised his hand. I'm sorry, Albrecht. Perhaps another time, if you will let the offer stand. I understand. I will set the bottle aside just for you. 
The doctor saw Ludlov looking around nervously. If you are looking for your horse, the animal is in my stable. I will walk you to it. Relieved, Ludlov joined the doctor to the back of the town hall. There stood a wooden stable with room enough for six horses. Thank you, Halbrecht. I suppose you want to leave without too much fanfare. Yes. Then I bid you farewell for now, Ludlov. May we meet again. May we meet again. And with another cordial handshake, they parted ways. Ludlov entered the stable, seeing his horse there alive and well-groomed. The prospect of returning to Seven Peaks made his heart swell. Perhaps he loved his city more than he cared to admit. He was making ready to leave when unexpectedly, Adolfans appeared at the entrance of the stable. Congratulations! Looks like you acted on time. <laughs> Thank you. Of course, it probably helped that your captain was out of the picture for a little bit. <laughs> we were both very worried. Ludlov simply looked at him with a neutral expression. Then Adolfans shrugged again nervously scratching at a splinter in one of the wooden beams of the stable. Well, when Nikki woke up, she was completely inconsolable. And to be honest, we were both terrified. We talked a lot, and... And I, um... I bared my soul to her. I confessed my feelings. It seems to have worked. As it turns out, we have loved each other from afar for a long time. Good. Very good. Then Ludlov approached Adolfons with a very serious look in his eye. You will be a father to her little boy, Adolfons. The only father he will ever know. I know. It will be an honor. Ludlov studied the young man's face. His sincerity was beyond question. Never underestimate the importance of a father in a boy's life. Then Ludlov thought of Hans, and the sort of father he had known his entire life. While the Count had been kind to him, Ludlov could hardly believe that the evil practices of the nobleman hadn't rubbed off in some way. May I ask you something, Adolfans? Of course, Master Ludlov. I am in your debt. After all, you were the one who told me to express my feelings to Nicky. Ludlov took a deep breath, gazing at some unseen point outside of the stable. Then he turned to Adolfans again. The young man who came with us. The pale one. I've noticed him. Who is he? His name is Hans. He is Heidi Winkler's son. Truly? Heidi's son? Yes. I want to ask you one thing, Adolfans. He's a good man. Like Frederick, he wasn't raised by his real father, but he did have a father who loved him. He was not as fortunate as Frederick will be, though. The father he had was not a good man. I want to ask you to be his friend. Adolfans gave him a surprised look. I don't even know him. How can I know we'll be friends? Ludlov's horse snorted, and he softly patted its neck before responding to Adolfans. Just try. He needs a good friend. There is something within him that must not go awry. And I believe you will be able to help him with that. Then Ludlov took off his hat and laid it on a nearby bench. Bowing his head, he grasped the chain that held the amulet of Sancta Gwendala around his neck. Oh, no, please, don't. He took off the amulet and handed it over to the young guardsman, who accepted it reluctantly. Then Ludlov peered into Adolfans's eyes with bright intensity. I solemnly confirm to you, Adolphons, that this amulet holds very great power. The power of a great saint's certain intercedence in your darkest hour, if you wear it well. I would have been shamed, devoured, and damned if you hadn't given me this. Now I tell you to take it back, guard it, Wear it, and pray to Sancta Gwendala when you have need of her help. Use it to look out for Hans. Write to me if anything unusual ever happens. 
Will you promise me that? Adolphus's honest eyes had already answered. But Lulla felt relief in his heart when he heard him say the words out loud. I promise, Master Ludlow. The witch hunter smiled. Then, against his own expectations, ah. he gave Adolphus a hug. Give my warmest regards to your fiancé and your future father-in-law. Then, without further words, Ludlow took his hat and put it back on. He prepared the saddle and mounted his steed. <coughs> Adolfuns understood that the witch hunter wanted to slip away quietly from Schnatwald. It was time for Ludlow <coughs> to return to Seven Peaks. have been listening to The Beast of the Western Wilds, a witch hunter tale. This dramatized audiobook was written, produced and narrated by Domine de Groot. The music was composed by Peter van Riet and Dane Lennartsen. Additional underscore by Domine de Groot. The cast featured the following voices. Domine de Groot as Ludlow, Eileen Hoskins as Nikki Elsenbach and Krasso Aldin, Dane Lennartsen as Captain Elsenbach, Karim Kronfli as Count Edelhard, Matthew McLean as Rudolf, Robert Cudmore as Adolphus, Sarah Golding as Heidi Winkler and the Tavern Wench, Nicholas Reinhold as Conrad. Aaron Bodanovic as Dr. Schmetterling. Grace van Leisebetten as the Farmer Lady. Olivier Fuchs as Hans Winkler. And Ronan de Groot as the Snatchers and Little Frederick Elsenbach.
So I promised that there would be an announcement at the end of the episode, and here we are. Since the beast is finished, there won't be any new story material out for a while on this channel or on this podcast. But rest assured, we are working on new material, and this is my announcement. We've got two projects now in the writing phase. First up is a new story, an audio drama written by my wife Eline, and it's called Prince of Truth. Prince of Truth is not a witch hunter story, it is its own thing. It's more in the same vein as uh, The Will of the Woods. It's a fantasy fairy tale for all ages, and it will be out later this year. Meanwhile, I am working on The Word of Wolfen, and The Word of Wolfen is the direct sequel to Witch Hunter. So we're finally going to get an answer to some of the questions that were raised at the end of the original Witch Hunter in this bigger, more epic, more ambitious second part of the saga. Of course, such a big story will take time. I first have to write it. I've got an outline. Uh, that's finished. But um, there is still so much work. I mean, I still have to start actually writing the book. So... Uh, <laughs> So I have to ask for your patience, but um, rest assured, it is coming. Next week, I've got a special little episode planned, which I am calling The Beast of the Western Wilds, a retrospective. It's kind of a little making of episode in which I will be talking about this story, how it came to be, um, the music, some of the people involved, etc. And I will also be playing some of the music tracks that you hear in... Uh, in the story. So I hope you will enjoy that, and I'm afraid that this concludes the Beast of the Western Wilds run on our podcast and on YouTube for now. And um, I look forward to talking to you guys very soon again.